April 1868, 38th Annual Conference. Today is the 38th anniversary of the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Much as the Church has been called to pass through during those 38 years, bitter and cruel as have been the persecutions that have been heaped upon us, relentless the animosity with which, during long and suffering years, wicked and malignant sectaries followed our weary and broken footsteps, we can, today, look around at the condition of the world, and be stirred with lively emotions of gratitude at our condition as a people. We enjoy peace, while the commotion which shakes nations and kingdoms is looked upon by the wisest statesmen of today as but the prelude to renewed, bitter, and deadly war, which will shake the civilized world from center to circumference. As we assemble together in our meetings at this general conference, the feelings of union and confidence in each other and in our leaders, which pervade the thousands who thus come together, are confined in anything like such extent to these valleys and this people alone. The Lord, who led us by his servants and preserved us in, his, in our journeyings and wanderings, has blessed us abundantly in these mountains, and we have much reason to be filled with gratitude to him for his abundant mercies. Though the 38th General Conference of the Church convened this morning at 10 o'clock, the meetings yesterday were held in the New Tabernacle were largely attended and very interesting. Hence, we append a brief synopsis of the discourses with the regular conference minutes. Sunday, April 5, 1868, 10 a.m. Singing by the Tabernacle Choir. Sing to the Great Jehovah's Praise. Prayer by Elder W. W. Phelps. Singing, Behold the Mountain of the Lord. Elder Joseph F. Smith rejoiced in the truth and rejoiced that he had a testimony of it, to bear to the children of men. He knew the gospel, of which he is a minister, to be true, and that it would bring blessings to all the human family who will obey its principles. Everyone who engages in the work of God shares a portion of the responsibility of building up his kingdom. It is the duty of all such, equally with their brethren, to seek to extend truth and salvation among the children of men. We must cling close to the Lord in prayer, lean upon and seek aid from him, and he will strengthen and sustain us. We will be able to see his hand in all things and have power to do his will. But if we neglect to call upon his name, we will be weak and powerless, left to wander in darkness, knowing not God nor his ways. Elder Wilfred Woodruff spoke of the work to be performed in this dispensation by the people of God, and the privileges bestowed upon them, compared with the labors required of, and the privileges bestowed upon the people of preceding dispensations. Seeing the greatness of the work to be performed, the question which every Latter-day Saint should ask himself is, What can I do to advance the purposes of God? The Lord has declared by his prophets in all preceding dispensations that in this one he will redeem the earth from the power of Satan and set up his kingdom, never more to be thrown down. We are engaged in that work, and we should seek diligently to perform our duties in connection therewith and fulfill the purposes of the Lord. Elder Joseph W. Young stated that he had just returned with Elder Erastus Snow from the southern settlements, and gave a brief description of his trip and the condition of matters south. The brethren who had gone from this part of the territory last fall are generally doing pretty well, laboring to make themselves homes. A few had gone up to the muddy a distance and made an, to make a new settlement, without due consideration which had operated somewhat against their progress for a time. But now they are acting according to good counsel given them by President E. Snow, and their prospects are brightening. He treated on the principle of faith, and the works that had been accomplished by this people through faith, urging that in the south and in the north, and wherever we have to live and labor, we must possess faith to accomplish that which is required of us, and we must be humble and obedient to learn wisdom and be truly united. Singing by the Choir, Prayer by Elder John Taylor, 2 p.m., singing Happy the Man Who Finds the Grace by the Choir. Prayer by Bishop E. D. Woolley, singing, Creation Speaks with Awful Voice. President B. Young inquired of persons in different parts of the house whether they could hear, and being answered in the affirmative from a number of points, he said one fact was very apparent, that we have never been able to get a hall sufficiently large in which the people could con convene at general conference. This was proved last October conference, when many were precluded from hearing and obtaining seats because of the lack of room. The design is to put a galley in the new tabernacle, that more space may thus be obtained for seating a still larger number of people. The gospel which we have received, and which we wish brought to the hearing of all men and women on the earth, 
comprises within it every blessing pertaining to time or to eternity. Everything that is desirable, that pertains to life, that will make mankind happy in this life or in the eternal worlds is to be found within the religion we have embraced, the gospel that has been revealed, for the salvation of man. We have scarcely commenced to learn the first lesson concerning our exaltation. There is an eternity of knowledge before us, and as our understandings are opened to comprehend in part the works of God around us, we see the visible hand of providence in all, and realize a little how vast the amount of knowledge is that has to be acquired before we are exalted in the presence of our Father and God. What do the philosophers of the world know of death, its operations, and the existence beyond the tomb? Death is an active, living thing. What do they know of life or its causes, of the human mind, its power and workings? They speculate and theorize, but what real knowledge have they? All who have received any knowledge of these things have received it through revelation. Our religion is practical. Its, obs its observance is not confined to any one day, but to all of our lives. He was satisfied even before he had heard the gospel, or had seen the prophet Joseph, that the sects of the age were powerless to bring salvation to any soul, but the gospel comes with power to those who receive it. And if they live so as to possess the Holy Spirit, and have the revelations of heaven, light, and intelligence, and truth, and understanding will increase with them continually. He exhorted the people to live close to God, instructing them that it is not the performance of some particular duty, such as preaching the gospel that is alone acceptable with God, but the faithful discharge of every duty required of us is pleasing in His sight. If we wish to be useful, let us be useful here, and let us learn to prolong our lives upon the earth, so as to give healthy organizations to our offspring and good health to ourselves, by exercising wisdom in the food we use, in our labors, and in properly caring for the bodies which have been given to us. And let us live, so that the power of God may be with us to rebuke the destroyer, and cast him out from our tabernacles and our families. Elder George A. Smith touched upon the wickedness that characterized the generation of men from the earliest days, and the frustration thereby and the, of the means employed by the Lord at various times to bring salvation to the human family. He referred to the history of the Nephites recorded in the Book of Mormon to show that the lives of men were prolonged under the reign of righteousness among that people. The Lord has commenced a reign of righteousness in this age, and he has gathered a few people here to these valleys to instruct them, to change their habits and customs, and make of them a people who will fear his laws and obey his commandments. And we should learn to hearken to the instructions given us, that we may be prepared to aid in accomplishing the purposes of the Almighty. Singing Daughter of Zion Prayer by Elder George Q. Cannon Monday morning, April 6. Conference convened pursuant to adjournment from the 9th of last October, and was called to order at 10 o'clock by President B. Young. There were present in the stand of the First Presidency... Presidents Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, and Daniel H. Wells, and John Young, President of the High Priest Quorum. In the Apostles' Stand, Orson Hyde, Orson Pratt, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, George A. Smith, Ezra T. Benson, Lorenzo Snow, Erastus Snow, George Q. Cannon, and Joseph F. Smith of the Quorum of the Twelve. In the Stand of the Presidency of this Stake of Zion, Daniel Spencer, George B. Wallace and Joseph W. Young, the Presidency of the Stake, John Smith, Patriarch, E. D. Woolley and Samuel W. Richards of the Presidency of the High Priest Quorum, and Levi W. Hancock of the Presidency of the Seventies. In the Bishop stand, Bishop Edward Hunter, his counselors Leonard W. Hardy and Jesse C. Little, Bishop N. Davis, Elders D J. D. T. McAllister, and George Goddard. On the general stand were a large number of bishops, high priests, and elders from this stake of Zion and from other parts of the territory. At the reporter's table were George D. Watt, David W. Evans, T. B. H. Stenhouse, and Edward L. Sloan. Singing by the choir, Praise ye the Lord, tis good to praise. Prayer by President Heber C. Kimball. Singing anthem, The Lord is King. President B. Young stated the objects of the conference and intimated that the time would be occupied in speaking to the people, presenting the authorities of the church for their acceptance or rejection, and attending to such other matters as might be deemed necessary. President H. C. Kimball reasoned on the principle of unity, its growth among the saints, 
and the course to be pursued by them, the obedience, faithfulness, and diligence necessary to reach that condition of unity required of us. We look forward with anticipation to building up the center stake of Zion, and many are anxious for it, and will expect to be included among those called to go to Jackson County, who realize but little of the progress they have to make before they are prepared to do so. We have to become much more united, to put away evil from us, to shun evil speaking, and realize the full meaning of the injunction, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. If we do wrong, we must make restitution, cease all wickedness, shun iniquity of every kind, and live to do so, possess the Spirit of God, that it will guide and direct us. The angels and holy beings in the eternal worlds are interested in the work of God in which we are engaged. They watch its progress, and they exercise care over those who are laboring to spread truth and righteousness. Brother Kimball referred to incidents in his own experience of the ministration of beings from the internal world and exhorted the people to continue an increasing righteousness. President D. H. Wells treated on the completeness of the gospel, the perfection of the government of God, and the fullness of the blessings which are brought to all those who embrace and live according to the principles of truth. He referred to the statement of President Young made yesterday, that the individuals who have obeyed the word of wisdom during the past year have enjoyed far better health than those who have not done so and reason that our obedience to this requirement would not only directly conduce to our health, but would increase our faith and confidence in God, and His power would be with and attend us to a far greater extent. And when sickness would seize upon us or our families, we could call upon the elders with confidence, and their administration would be owned and blessed by the Lord. The church and kingdom of God is growing rapidly, and the purposes of the Almighty are being accomplished and it devolves upon us to grow in faith and in knowledge, in power, and in understanding proportionate therewith. The gospel will teach us to make farms, build houses and cities, and develop the resources of the earth where we reside. It will bring the downtrodden myriads of the world from the poverty-stricken homes where they are tyrannized over to a land of freedom and teach them how to live in comfort and lead them onwards and upwards to salvation. He urged wisdom in our work, in our eating and drinking, and in all that appertains to life, showing that the laws of heaven are the laws of life, and will prolong our lives and make us happy if we obey them. He advocated the cultivation of a breadth of land which can be well and thoroughly labored, the caring properly for stock and domestic animals, and the hearkening to the counsels given with regard to home manufactures and the means to be used to become truly independent. Singing, Israel, Israel, God is Calling. Prayer by Elder George Q. Cannon. Monday, 2 p.m., a vast congregation of people had assembled together by the time for commencing the afternoon meeting. The choir sang the hymn commencing An Angel from on High. Prayer was offered by Elder Orson Pratt, after which the choir sang an anthem. Elder George A. Smith dwelt upon the importance of keeping the Sabbath day holy, quoting from the Revelations in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, 149th page and 2nd section, and 160th page and 4th section, where it is enjoined upon the saints to observe the Sabbath day. We should not work on that day, but we should meet together to offer up our oblations and sacraments to the Lord, and not only is it right in a religious view, being a command of God, but it is also necessary that the human system should have regular seasons of resting, when it can relax from the constant strain of work, and these the Sabbath affords. He referred to the efforts made to gather the saints, and said that though much had been done, much remains to be done. And he urged the preparing of teams and wagons, food, etc., to bring them from the railway terminus. He advocated fish culture, maintaining that fish can be as easily and as cheaply raised as any kind of food, and is superior to the flesh of animals. Silk making and silk manufacture were urged by him as a most profitable branch of industry. Our climate and soil are excellent for these purposes, and we possess advantages, such as can be found in few if any other places on the earth, for keeping worms and obtaining an excellent quality of silk. We can have silk as cheaply as we can woolen and cotton fabrics, though it is much richer and much more durable. Importance of Observing the Sabbath Day Emigration of the Poor Fish Culture, Producing Silk, Discourse by Elder George A. Smith, delivered in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, 
April 6, 1868, reported by David W. Evans. We have been in the habit of looking contemptuously on the sectarian world, so far as their habits appear to us to be the indications of hypocrisy. Among them men take great pains to seem to be religious. They will put on a long face, a sad countenance, and on the Sabbath day they will endeavor to seem to be very holy. But as soon as the Sabbath has gone by, a great many men will not scruple to commit the most outrageous acts of dishonesty and corruption, thinking perhaps by being so very good on the Sabbath day that the wickedness and corruption of the remaining six days will be sanctified and justified. Well, we have looked contemptuously upon a spirit of this kind, and in so doing some of us may have failed to appreciate, as we ought, the importance of observing the Sabbath day. We may have felt that it was a tradition that we and our fathers had inherited from the sectarian world. There are many instances of our brethren failing to observe the Sabbath day, some going to the canyon on a Saturday for wood or lumber, knowing that they could not return with their loads until Sunday, or going out to hunt cattle, when they knew they could not accomplish what they desired without breaking the Sabbath. I feel a desire to call the intention of the conference to the consideration of this subject, because it not only involves the commandment given in the law of Moses and endorsed by the New Testament, but it has been also enjoined upon us by revelation, through Joseph Smith in the present generation, and if we neglect it, we have no right to expect the blessings of God to that extent that its observance would ensure. We find on the 149th page of the Book of Doctrine and Covenants something on the subject, to which I wish to call attention of the brethren and sisters. It reads as follows. Wherefore I give unto them a commandment, saying thus, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, mind, and strength, and in the name of Jesus Christ thou shalt serve him. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, thou shalt not steal, neither commit adultery, nor kill, nor do anything like unto it. Thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. Thou shalt offer a sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in righteousness, even that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And that thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day. For verily this is a day appointed unto you to rest from your labors, and to pay thy devotions unto the Most High. Nevertheless, thy vows shall be offered up in righteousness on all days and in all times. But remember that on this the Lord's day thou shalt offer thine oblations and thy sacraments unto the Most High, confessing thy sins unto thy brethren and before the Lord. And on this day thou shalt do none other thing, only let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart, that thy fasting may be perfect, or in other words, that thy joy may be full. Verily this is fasting and prayer, or in other words, rejoicing in prayer. I read this simply to call your attention to the law as it has been given to us through Joseph Smith our prophet, and to impress upon the minds of the elders the necessity of observing it. We find it also enjoined upon us in a portion of section 4 of a revelation on page 160 of the Book of Doctrine and Covenants which reads as follows, And the inhabitants of Zion shall also observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I have felt that it was necessary to call the attention of the saints, the brethren especially, to this subject, because I believe it affects us in various ways. We should come together on the Sabbath day and partake of the sacrament, and we should do no work but what is necessary to prepare food for ourselves or to feed our animals. We should observe the Sabbath as a day of rest, and if we do it faithfully, we shall live longer, for my impression is, saying nothing about the commandment of the Lord, that nature requires one-seventh of our time for rest, and that when a man has worked fifty-two Sundays a year, he is at least fifty-two days older than he needs to be, and has not done as much work during the year as if he had work only six days a week, and had rested the seventh. I hope our brethren will hereafter make their calculations to observe the Sabbath, and thus act in accordance with the law of God. The evidence is plain on the face of the Book of Mormon, that when men commence to live in accordance with the laws of the gospel, as the people of Nephi did for about two hundred years, after the Saviour visited the land bountiful, they shall begin to be stronger and to live longer. Amos, the son of Nephi, kept the records on the plates of Nephi eighty-four years, and his son Amos kept them one hundred and eleven years. Book of Mormon, pages 494-6, to six, sections 8 and 11. Previous to this period, the Book of Mormon shows that the Nephites were a short-lived race. The observance of the Sabbath 
as well as the observance of every other commandment of God, has a tendency to prolong human life. There is nothing to prevent us commencing by observing the word of wisdom, to lengthen our days, in accordance with the words of the prophecies of Isaiah, which says, For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. There are several subjects I wish to refer to in addressing my brethren this conference. One of them is the emigration of the poor from Europe, which was agitated last fall conference. Some of the brethren have contributed liberally, and sufficient means have been collected to aid a considerable number, but nothing like that was desired. Yet with what has been raised here, with that which may be possessed by some who are partly able to help themselves, we expect to bring 5,000 adults to the railway terminus. We also expect to raise the wagons, mules, and oxen necessary to fit up teams, and the necessary provisions and teamsters, guards, and arms to go from here to the terminus of the railroad, and bring home the brethren and sisters and their children who may gather to that point. We also want to make plans and calculations, and every man and woman throughout the territory should feel that it is a part of their duty to contribute his or her share to accomplish this, and then to lay a foundation for setting all these people to work at something that will enable them to live and acquire a competence as well as return the means expended in bringing them here. Those indebted to the Perpetual Emigration Fund should feel the importance of paying their indebtedness, and those who are not indebted should feel alive and awake to the accomplishment of this object. It is a great and glorious work which we have undertaken, and it will never do for us to be discouraged and leave it half done. There is another subject under consideration which weighs very heavily upon the minds of the saints. The word of wisdom recommends us to use the flesh of animals sparingly. The law of Moses prohibited to Israel the use of swine's flesh, but in the Gentile world, the present day, it is considered superior as food to almost every other kind of flesh. And even among us, with the education and training that we have received, there is a great deal of it used. It seems to be a pretty general idea among the people that swine's flesh can be more easily raised than any other. But there is no doubt that, with proper care and attention, other kinds of meat might be produced with equal facility. For some reason, God, by special law, prohibited its use to the children of Israel, and it certainly seems desirable that we should also discontinue its use, as within the past few years in some countries, where a great amount of pork has been consumed, the people have been afflicted with a kind of pestilence, a disease which is considered incurable. It is therefore wise and prudent for us to adopt plans to procure supplies from other sources. In some countries the culture of fish has recently been introduced. It was commenced in the first place by sportsmen for the purpose of increasing the amusement of anglers, but the French government, under the reign of the present emperor, have commenced to stock the rivers of France with fish, for the purpose of increasing the supply of healthful food to the people. This is being done successfully in New England, where rivers were formerly well stocked with salmon and other varieties of fish, though for many years they have become extinct. Laws have been passed in New Hampshire, Maine, and other eastern states requiring the owners of mills to construct fishways over their dams, so that fish can pass freely up and down the streams, the dams having heretofore effectually prevented this. Persons have also been employed to restock the rivers, and in this way many choice varieties of fish have been again successfully introduced. The real fact is that they are as easily raised as hogs if the proper attention is paid to them. Our beautiful lakes, such as Utah Lake and Bear Lake, our rivers and even our springs can, with a very little trouble and expense, be made to yield an immense quantity of this healthful food. I wish to call the attention of the bishops and elders at home and abroad to the propriety of studying this question, and if they lack information on the subject, just let them drop a note to the Honorable W. H. Hooper, our delegate at Washington, and ask him to furnish information on the culture of fish. He has it in his reach through the Bureau of Agriculture and can send it under his own frank, and that will put you in possession of the information you require. You can feed fish as well as hogs, and they will eat a great many things you are little aware of, and with a little trouble you can procure that which will furnish an agreeable and healthy change in our diet. I also wish to advise our brethren, the bishops especially, to consider the propriety of taking proper measures for the production of poultry. Their flesh is agreeable and much more healthful as food than using great quantities of pork, as we are compelled to do in many instances. I will also call the attention of the congregation to the subject of raising silk. 
We are anxious to dress in broadcloth and to wear fine clothing, but there is a difficulty in the way of our sending abroad for them. We have scarcely anything that we can send to purchase the necessary material, hence the necessity of taking measures to raise it here. The revelation given to the church years ago, to let the beauty of our garments be the workmanship of our own hands, although it has not remained a dead letter, has never been fully complied with, and it is time that we, as a people, should be thinking of some new industry by which the kinds of clothing we desire may be produced, and also have a production or staple of some kind that we can send abroad that will bring us wealth in return, instead of sending away all our money and bringing nothing back. It has been proven by a few years' experience that the mulberry tree grows in this country. The climate agrees with it, and it grows rapidly and thrives well. It has also been proven that the silkworm is healthy in this climate, and experiments have proven the fact that the silk of a fine quality can be produced here in abundance. Now silk has commanded gold in all ages. It once would pay for transportation over land on the backs of animals from the frontiers of China to the west of Europe and silk garments have been considered so delightful that they were worth their weight in gold. And in consequence of the high esteem in, in which it has ever been and is yet held high, the trade in silk is still very remunerative. We would like to see our wives and daughters clad in the most delightful silk, but we cannot get it, and yet it can be cultivated and produced by their own nimble fingers. In this climate, just as easily as flax or wool, and at very little more expense. Several years ago in the States, there was quite an excitement on this subject, but it proved a failure. The reason was that in many of the States where the experiment was tried, the climate was too severe for the culture of the proper varieties of the mulberry. They would kill it with winter frosts, and then the summers were too damp or rainy for the healthy production of the worm. Our climate is particularly fitted in these respects. Our dry summers and mild winters are both suitable, and there is not a doubt, but as fine silk may be produced here as anywhere in the world. President Young has taken pains to introduce the mulberry. He sent to Europe and obtained the proper kind of seed. It can be grown from the seed and multiplied to any extent from the cuttings. Our brethren in every ward should take this matter in hand and plant out these cuttings and send for the silkworms and set in operation a new branch of industry, which will employ us some six weeks or two months in the summertime in feeding and taking care of the worms. The residue of the labor, winding and manufacturing the raw material into silk, can be conducted through the year. Millions of dollars worth of silk might thus be annually produced in this territory from labor that now counts very little. The feeble, the aged, the lame, and almost any person, no matter how weakly, might be employed at this business, and silk always fetches such a price that it would pay us for sending it abroad, in addition to the amount we might use. It is just as easy for us to clothe ourselves with silk, the workmanship of our own hands, as to go ragged. Then I feel it, conscientiously, to be a duty we owe to ourselves as a people, and the obedience we owe to the revelations of the Lord, that we should add this industry to the branches we have already commenced. We should also take care of our sheep, and continue to erect woolen manufactories, and never relax our efforts in the cultivation of flax, hemp, and cotton, for all these articles in their time and season are indispensable, and with the whole of them put together, the silk, wool, flax, hemp, and cotton, we need ask no odds of mankind for clothes to wear, however beautiful we may choose to make them. Elder George Q. Cannon said that to properly enjoy the blessings within our reach, we must pursue a course to prolong our lives and preserve our health, Abstinence from stimulants such as tea, coffee, tobacco, and alcoholic liquors is not only desirable but necessary, and the very sparing use of beef and mutton in hot weather is conducive to health, while swine's flesh should be entirely abstained from. But we must have sufficient variety of food, not a great variety at every meal, but our food varied at different times, that the stomach may be kept healthy and the appetite unpalled. He advocated the importance of fish culture and the value of fish as an article of diet, which was declared to possess brain-making material to a greater extent than any other kind of animal food. Simplicity of diet is necessary, so that the digestive powers may not be overburthened, and that our wives and daughters may not be overtasked with unnecessary household duties. Word of Wisdom 
Fish Culture, Dietetics, Discourse by Elder George Q. Cannon, delivered in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, April 7, 1868, reported by David W. Evans. The subjects which have been touched upon by Brother George A. Smith ought to be of paramount importance to us as a people under our present circumstances. The gospel of life and salvation which we have received would be of comparatively little avail to us unless we can prolong our lives and the lives of our children and posterity on the earth. The greatest boon that God has given us, and that upon which every other hinges, is life. Which life we need health, the power to carry out designs of our being upon the earth. Without these blessings, everyone must perceive that other blessings which we value very highly would be of little or no account. God has moved upon his servant Brigham in a very powerful manner of late to stir up the people's minds to the consideration of a great variety of subjects connected with our temporal well-being. And the more these subjects are reflected upon, the more important do they appear. The more we hear about them, the more we are impressed with the necessity of paying attention to them. We have heard considerable of late, especially since twelve months today, on the subject of the Word of Wisdom. Almost every elder who has spoken from this stand has felt the necessity and importance of calling the attention of the people to this subject. We are told, and very plainly too, that hot drinks, tea, coffee, chocolate, cocoa, and all drinks of this kind are not good for man. We are also told that alcoholic drinks are not good, and that tobacco, when either smoked or chewed, is an evil. We are told that swine's flesh is not good, and that we should dispense with it, and we are told that flesh of any kind is not suitable to man in the summertime, and ought to be eaten sparingly in the winter. The question arises in the minds of a great many people. What, then, are we to eat if we drop swine's flesh, and eat very little beef or mutton, and cannot drink tea or coffee? Why, dear me, we would starve to death. In conversation with one of the brethren the other day, he remarked, The diet of the poor is principally bread and meat, and if they dispense with meat, they will be reduced to very hard fare. I reasoned with him on the subject, and before we got through, I believe I convinced him that other articles of food could be raised more cheaply and in greater variety than the flesh of animals. But just at the present time, we are destitute to some extent of this needed variety, and hence the very apparent necessity that we as a people should turn our attention to the multiplication of varieties of food in our midst. We should not confine ourselves to a few articles of diet and be content therewith, but the people who have the opportunity of doing so should cultivate a variety of food for the benefit of themselves and families. It is a fact, which the experience of ages has confirmed, that man, of all creatures, requires the greatest variety of food. His stomach is fitted to digest a greater variety of food than the stomach of any other animal. God has created him Lord of creation, and all that is created around us is created for man's use and benefit. It would therefore be very unwise for intelligent man, inasmuch as God has given to him the vegetable creation, and has made him lord of the animal creation, and placed him as monarch of the finny tribes, to be content to sit down and eat as our degraded Indians do. It is to remedy this, that we hear the teachings that are given at the present time by the servants of God. Man requires food to build up his body. He requires food that is adapted to the development of bone, muscle, and sinew, but this is not all. He requires food that is suitable to feed his brain and to supply the waste sustained in consequence of the use of his mental faculties. There is a necessity, therefore, for us to take these things into consideration. My opinion is that it will be most difficult for fathers of families to induce their wives and children to refrain from the use of tea and coffee, if they do not supply their tables with other articles in their place, and unless food suitable to the requirements of the human system is provided, our wives and children will be exposed to constant temptation to transgress the counsels that are given in regard to our diet. It is an exceedingly difficult thing for most people to break off and discontinue cherished and long-standing habits. A man who has never drunk tea, coffee, or spirit, or one who has never chewed or smoked tobacco, is not at all affected by the counsel to discontinue their use. But they who have been accustomed to them miss them when they are deprived of them, and they want something to supply their place. I speak now, not from my own experience, but what I have heard others say on these things. There is a craving felt by the parties when they discontinue the use of these stimulants, and they need variety. This variety must be supplied, and we must take steps to supply it. The culture of fish has been alluded to. Physiologists say that fish contain more of the elements necessary to strengthen and build up the brain than almost any other known substance. 
It would supply a great want if we had it in abundance. But our supply of this article of food is very limited, and hence we are taught at the present time to take measures for its increase. I see no reason why we should not raise our own fish as we do our eggs and chicken. This territory is better adapted to the raising of fish, in consequence of our system of irrigation, than any on the continent we know anything of. And I believe that the time is not far distant when our farmers will raise fish for their own tables, as they now raise beef, mutton, pork, fruit, or any other article of diet now in use. It can be done easily by bestowing a little attention, thought, and care on the subject. We must also cultivate fruit more extensively than we now do, and we must multiply every variety of diet, and if it is possible to discover new varieties. It is only a few hundred years since the potato was discovered, and what a blessing it has proved to man. There are other vegetables probably as good and as healthful as it is if we could only bring them into use. But vegetables are not grown among us as they should be. There is not that attention paid to them that it seems to me they should receive. My theory is that if we raise a healthy, noble-looking, intelligent, and perfect, and perfect race of men and women, we must feed our children properly. We must prevent the use by them of every article that is hurtful or noxious in its nature. We must not permit them to drink liquor or hot drinks or hot soups, or to use tobacco or other articles that are injurious. I do not believe that you could ever make as great and noble a race of men if you feed them on one article of food alone, as if you gave them a variety of diet. We have illustrations of this in India, where the chief diet is rice, of itself a very good article of food. We have other illustrations of this case in other races, a people who, for instance, are fed on potatoes alone, do not have the stamina that they would if they had a greater variety of food. Such a people could, I believe, be kept subjected more easily to thraldom than a nation which is better fed. The millions of India are kept in subjection by as many thousands of Europeans. There are doubtless many causes for this, among the chief of which is their diet. God has given to us a land that is bounteous. Every variety of food can be produced here in the greatest profusion. It only requires the exercise of the powers with which we are endowed, with proper industry to bring forth food in the greatest abundance and supply every want of man and beast. But whilst I speak in this strain about a variety of food, I am opposed in my own feelings to a great variety of food at one meal. I believe that we enslave our women, we crush out their lives by following the pernicious habits of our forefathers in this respect. We sit down to table and, especially if we have friends, our tables are covered with every delicacy and variety that we can think of. I believe in variety at different meals, but not at one meal. I do not believe in mixing up our food. This is hurtful. It destroys the stomach by overtaxing the digestive powers, and in addition to that, it almost wears out the lives of our females by keeping them so closely confined over cooking stoves. A variety of food is not incompatible with simplicity of cooking. They can go hand in hand. We can have a variety in diet, and yet have simplicity. We can have a diet that will be easily prepared, and yet have it healthful. We can have a diet that will be tasteful, nutritious, and delightful to us, and easy to digest, and yet not wear out the lives of our mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters in its preparation. These are topics, my brethren and sisters, that should claim the attention of the Latter-day Saints, because they pertain to our everyday existence here on the earth. And if we follow the course marked out, and seek to follow the counsels given, the result will be that, here in these valleys, we shall raise a race of men who will be the joy of the earth whose complexions will be like the complexions of angels, full of health, purity, innocence, and vitality. Men who will live under the wheels of life will stand still in consequence of the gradual decay of the body, not afflicted and brought to the grave prematurely by disease engendered by improper feeding and other unhealthy habits. We can do what no other people ever could do, at least no other people living at the present generation. We are here a new people, forming our habits and laying the foundation of a great work, and of course are in a state of transition. We can therefore, if we so please, accommodate ourselves to new habits, habits recommended and taught to us by the servants of God. One of the great advantages that would result from our having a more simple diet would be that we should be less apt to overload our stomachs through the tempting character of the food we eat. How often is it the case, after we have eaten through, someone is, somebody will say, here is something I would like you to eat a little of. Do taste it. Well, you taste, and before you are aware of it, you have eaten more than you should. Your stomach rebels, and you feel that you have done a wrong. And if your stomachs are weak, you have to pay the penalty of your imprudence. We are expecting a heavy emigration this season. 
we hope to see them come by thousands. How are these brethren and sisters to be employed? Already we are under tribute. The great majority of the articles of clothing that we wear is imported, and there is nothing more apparent to those who reflect on this subject than that we as a people must turn our attention to the creation of new industries. Our president has led out in this direction. He has set an example to the capitalists of this territory, worthy of all imitation by introducing from, for us to turn our attention to these branches. We must use the, fa the facilities God has given us in the best possible manner for increasing the means of employing those who come into our midst. It should be our aim as individuals, as families, and as a community to dispense with everything that we cannot manufacture. I am told that thousands of dollars a year are expended in supplying our tables with mustard imported from the East. I have no means of knowing the truth of this, but it seems incredible that we, with the facilities we have for its production, should depend upon importation for the supply of a Carmen article like mustard. But this is only one article. When we sit down at our tables and take a survey, we find many articles that are thus imported. It may be, and frequently is said, by a certain class of persons that articles can be imported much cheaper than they can be manufactured here. This is urged by them as a reason for importing, but it is a delusion and a snare. The man who utters such a sentiment is an ignoramus. He knows nothing about the true principles of building up a people and kingdom. That which is manufactured here, though it costs ten times the amount it would cost in the East, is the cheaper, for that is the commencement of independence. The man or the family who carries on home manufacture is laying the foundation for true and lasting independence. They are helping to emancipate the people here from the thraldom under which we have groaned, sweat, toiled, and bled for years. This territory has been bled of its money and life by this erroneous idea. We must stop this drain, or we will sink into slavery more abject than that felt by any other people on the continent. The cause of God requires us to take a different course. And if we pursue that marked out for us, means and facilities will increase on every hand. We would like to see it fashionable in the territory to dispense with all articles that are imported. But now, when one family procures an imported articles, their neighbors feel that they are not in fashion unless they have the same. One lady and gentleman must have a fashionable bonnet and hat, and their neighbors must have the same. You can see the result. These fashions make us slaves. Our young ladies are ashamed to go into company unless they can dress like their companions. Our young men feel the same, and it is not confined to one class. We all partake of it to a certain extent. We must reform. There is nothing more apparent than that. We must change our habits and make it fashionable to have articles of our own manufacture, and dispense with all articles that are not so, unless they are absolutely necessary for our comfort and well-being. The Lord has multiplied around us every facility for making us a great and mighty people. We have been able, in an astonishing manner, to create comfortable homes. The land has been touched by the power of God, and it yields to us its strength and abundance. Nowhere on the face of the earth can food be raised of a better quality than here. Our cereals, fruit, and vegetables are unsurpassed in the world. We can also produce the finest of hemp, flax, wool, and silk. All these articles can be produced in abundance here, if we will bestow the attention and care necessary for their culture. When we reflect upon our position twenty years ago, then this territory was a desert and we were cut off by almost illimitable stretches of barren waste from the rest of the world. We can realize to some extent what God has done for us. Now we and our children and the stranger can dwell here in peace, comfort, and security. This should stimulate us to press forward. There is no work too great under the blessing of God for us to accomplish if we will only exercise the ability and power that he has bestowed upon us. I look forward to the day, and I trust it is not far distant, when we will have everything in our midst necessary to make us a great and mighty people, when our young people will be the best educated, trained to the best manners, dressed in the best clothing, and appear to better advantage than any people on the continent or in the world. I look forward to this, and it seems to me that it is the near future. Great and wonderful changes will be effected in Zion. Our young people will be educated in true principles. They will be healthy and beautiful, filled with the Holy Spirit, and attractive to God and man. Our habitations will be delightful to visit. Our orchards and gardens and all our surroundings will be the most beautiful that can be imagined. Is there anything to prevent it? Nothing but our own unfaithfulness. God who has blessed us as we are blessed today is willing to bless us more abundantly. 
Heaven is full of blessings to be poured out upon us, if we will only prepare ourselves to receive them. The faith that the saints are now manifesting in sending for the poor will bring down the blessings of God upon them and will increase our faith to accomplish those labors that we have yet to perform. Send for 5,000 people. Yes, and the Latter-day Saints can do it and perform their other labors too. What effect does this have upon us? It fills us with faith and confidence that there is no labor that can be assigned to us that we cannot perform. And this is the training that God is giving to us. It is upon the principle that gymnasts perform their feats of almost superhuman strength by continued practice. It is so with us. God in the beginning gave us small works to accomplish. We performed them, and as a consequence had faith to attempt greater, and thus we have gone on until today, and the work we are now doing is preparatory to some greater work that he has yet in store for us to accomplish. May God bless us, my brethren and sisters, and his wisdom be given unto us. May his Holy Spirit rest mightily on all the Latter-day Saints, that their minds may be filled with it. When the prophet and servants of God speak unto us, our hearts may be prepared to receive their counsels, treasure up our words, and carry them out in our lives, that when Jesus comes, we may be prepared to meet him, which may God grant for Christ's sake. Amen. President B. Young referred to the efforts made in the beginning of cotton growing to get machinery introduced and to the labors which have been performed by the saints. He instructed the congregation on the use of meat, and said it was the will of the Lord that this people should cease eating swine's flesh. We should cultivate fruit to a still greater extent than we now do, and fish, as an article of food, is as healthy as any animal food that we can eat. He recommended the sisters to organize relief societies where it has not yet been done, and to organize societies to take the lead in fashions and in everything good and useful, called upon the bishops to plant rye, that the straw might be used in braiding hats and bonnets, and urged the raising of silk and the carrying out the counsels given with regard to home manufactures and other means requisite to make us independent in supplying our wants. Necessity of Obeying Counsel, Reformation in Eating and Drinking, Improvements, Female Relief Societies, Chastity, Remarks by President Brigham Young, delivered in the New Tabernacle, April 6, 1868. Reported by G.D. Watt. The items of instruction which have been laid before us by Elders George A. Smith and George Q. Cannon are very important to us. They are subjects which we have dwelt upon for years. It is generally known among us that we commenced some years ago to raise cotton in the southern portion of our territory. And it is also known that machinery to manufacture it has been introduced into this country. All this has been done to encourage the people to become self-sustaining. I am ready to acknowledge that the Latter-day Saints are the best people and the most willing people to do right that I know anything about, but when we take into particular and close consideration their acts and compare them with the teachings they are constantly receiving, we think and say they are very far from taking all the counsel given them of the Lord through his servants. But were they to be counseled, for instance, to go to the gold mines, many of them would obey with alacrity. If they were to be counseled to chew or smoke tobacco, many would lift up both hands for this and shout for joy. If the sisters, many of them, were counseled to continue the use of tea and coffee, they would sit up all night to bless you. When we are counseled to do that which pleases us, then we are willing to obey counsel. Yet when I consider the pit from whence we have been taken, and the rock from whence we have been hewn, I can say, praise the Latter-day Saints. Again, when we consider the immensity of knowledge and wisdom and understanding pertaining to the things of this life, pertaining to the learning of this world, pertaining to that which is within our reach and ready for the use and profit of the people, and particularly with regard to taking care of ourselves, and then consider our shortcomings and slothfulness, we may look upon ourselves with shamefacedness because of the smallness of our attainments in the midst of so many great advantages. A thorough reformation is needed in regard to our eating and drinking, and on this point I will freely express myself, and shall be glad if the people will hear, believe, and obey. If the people were willing to receive the true knowledge from heaven in regard to their diet, they would cease eating swine's flesh. I know this as well as Moses knew it, and without putting it in a code of commandments. When I tell you that it is the will of the Lord to cease eating swine's flesh, very likely someone will tell you that it is the will of the Lord to stop eating beef and mutton, and another that it is the will of the Lord to stop eating fowl and fish, until the minds of the people become bewildered, so that they know not how to decide between right and wrong, truth and error. The beef fed upon our mountain grasses is as healthy food as we need at present. 
Beef so fattened is as good as wild meat, and is quite different in his nature from stall-fed meat. But we can eat fish, and I ask the people of this community, who hinders you from raising fowl for their eggs? Who hinders you from cultivating fruit of every variety that will flourish in the different parts of this territory? There has not been a day through the whole winter that I have not had fresh peaches and plenty of apples and strawberries. Who hinders any person in this community from having these different kinds of food in their families? Fish is as healthy a food as we can eat, if we accept vegetables and fruit, and with them will become a very wholesome diet. What hinders us from surrounding ourselves with an abundance of those various articles of food which will promote health and produce longevity? If it is anything, it is our own neglect, or in other words, which will answer my purpose better, the want of knowing how. We cannot say there are loafers on our streets. Still, there are persons in our community who seem to have no other aim in existence than to pass away their time to no purpose or use to themselves or the community. They have nothing to do, and they think they cannot apply themselves to anything that will benefit themselves and their families, when they might with great propriety be engaged in laying out a garden, fencing and planting it, and laying a foundation to make themselves and their families comfortable. It is true we have taken a great share of this people from manufacturing districts, where the great masses of the people know nothing about cultivating the earth. But they can learn it soon, if they will, after they get here. Let your minds be at home, and let your attention be directed to that which the Lord has given you for honor and glory to yourself, instead of being the fool which Solomon wrote about, whose eyes are in the ends of the earth. Consider that you are at home, and strive to make your homes happy, comfortable, and delightful. Let the spirit which you enjoy yourself abound therein. What is the reason that our brethren do not progress faster in their improvements? In a great measure, it is for the want of leaders. But this is not altogether so. Generally, it is for lack of judgment and wisdom, tact and talent, taste, industry, and prudence in our bishops. As it has been said, as with the priests, so with the people. This is the case in a great measure, and we can say, as is the bishop, so are the members of his ward. It is the duty of the bishops to take a course to make their lives, characters, doings, and sayings fit examples in all things to the people of their wards. Some of our bishops have made no improvements for eighteen years. I have asked the bishops to sew a little rye, to make straw for hats and bonnets, and few ha a few have done so. I have asked them to do the same thing this spring, that the sisters of their wards may have straw to manufacture. If the bishops have not time to do this, or have not the ground, get some of the brethren to do it who have time and ground, and let there be an acre of rye sown to each ward and then ask the sisters to gather it in the proper season. Some say that wheat straw is as good as rye if properly prepared. Gather the straw, and make your bonnets and hats, and wear them when you come to this tabernacle, and make hats for your husbands and sons to wear, and for your brothers and sisters, your daughters and your mothers, and let us see all the sisters and all the brethren and all the children wearing hats and bonnets of material produced and manufactured by ourselves. I have been pleading for this for years and years. This is a leap year. Let the ladies take the lead in this, and every other species of home industry at which they can be employed. We have asked the sisters to organize themselves into relief societies. I again ask the sisters in every ward of the territory to do so, and get women of good understanding to be your leaders, and then get counsel from men of understanding, and let your fashions proceed from yourselves, and become acquainted with those noble traits of character which belong to your sex. Ever since I knew that my mother was a woman, I have loved the sex and delight in their chastity. The man who abuses or tries to bring dishonor upon the female sex is a fool, and does not know that his mother and his sisters were women. Women are more ready to do and love the right than men are, and if they could have a little guidance and were encouraged to carry out the instincts of their nature, they would effect a revolution for good in any community a great deal quicker than men can accomplish it. Men have been placed on the earth to bear rule and to lead in every good work, and if they would do their duty today in our government, then then throughout the world, they would stop whining about the Mormons marrying so many wives, and the ladies would have somebody to protect them, and they would not need to flee to the Mormon elders for protection. But outside of this community they are destroying the sex, ruining all they can, and then boast of their villainy. Shall I say that the women are short-sighted? I will say they are weak. I will say that it is in their nature to confide in and look to the sterner sex for guidance, and thus they are the more liable to be led astray and ruined. 
it is the decree of the Almighty upon upon them to lean upon man as their superior, and he has abused his privilege as their natural protector, and covered them with the abuse and dishonor. I wish the whole people of the United States could hear me now. I would say to them, let every man in the land over eighteen years of age take a wife, and then go to work with your own hands and cultivate the earth, or labor at some mechanical business, or some honest trade to provide an honest living for yourselves, and those who depend upon you for their subsistence, observing temperance and loving truth and virtue, then would the women be cared for, be nourished, honored, and blessed, becoming honorable mothers of a race of men and women farther advanced in physical and mental perfection than their fathers. This would create a revolution in our country, and would produce results that would be of incalculable good. If they would do this, the elders of this church would not be under the necessity of taking so many wives. Will they do this? No, they will not, and there are many who will continue to ruin every virtuous woman they can, buying the virtue of woman with money and deception, and thus the lords of creation proceed from one conquest to another, boasting of their victories, leaving ruin, tears, and death in their pathway. And what have they conquered? A poor, weak, confiding, loving woman. And what have they broken and crushed and destroyed? One of the fairest gems of all God's creation. O oh, man, for shame! If the men of the city of New York alone had done for the last twenty years, as the men of this community have done, from two to four hundred thousand of females from sixteen years of age and upwards, whose dishonor and ruin are mercifully covered in the grave, would now be in life and health, moving in the circles of happy homes, prayed for, respected, loved, and honored. Now, ladies, go to and organize yourselves into industrial societies and get your husbands to produce you some straw, and commence bonnet and hat making. If every ward would commence and continue this and other industrial pursuits, it would not be long before the females of the ward of our territory would have stores in their wards and means sufficient to send and get the articles which they need that cannot yet be manufactured here and which they may want to distribute. It is an old saying that a woman can throw out of the window with a spoon as fast as a man can throw into the door with a shovel, but a good housekeeper will be saving and economical and teach her children to be good housekeepers and how to take care of everything that is put in their charge. I do not wish to go into detail here. I see too much. I know too much of the waste and neglect of our females to feel satisfied with them. Is this any more so with the female portion of our community than among the males? No, not at all. But the neglect, the idleness, the waste, and the extravagance of men in our community are ridiculous. They are constantly taught better. They know better. Yet in many instances, the same reckless waste is indulged in by the whole family. If we will learn to be wise and careful, we shall devote all our time in a way that will be of the greatest advantage to us and to our common cause, continually bettering our condition and becoming more and more competent to do good. I have tried continually to get this people to pursue a course that will make them self-sustaining, taking care of their poor, the lame, the halt, and the blind, lifting ignorant from where they have no opportunity of observing the ways of the world and of understanding the common knowledge possessed among the children of men, bringing them together from the four quarters of the world and making them an intelligent, thrifty, and self-sustaining people. This is a work that is worthy the attention of these saints. We have gathered thousands from many nations. By the aid of the Almighty, we have raised them out of penury and miserable dependence and have taught them how to become wealthy in possessions, useful to themselves, and their neighbors, good citizens, and I trust, faithful saints. We are still continuing our labors in gathering the poor from foreign lands, and the people are doing marvels in contributing their means for this purpose, and it is still coming, and we hoped to be able to still enlarge our operations for the deliverance of the poor and downtrodden saints of all nations. We can continue to receive and send means until July. Now, sisters, will you commence to pay attention to the raising of silk, there are numbers of sisters in our community who could pay attention to this industry and teach the children to gather the mulberry leaves and to feed the worms. I wish all these sisters whose hands are not tied with large families to enter into this business with heart and hand in their different wards. Plant the mulberry tree and raise silk every year, also silkworm eggs. By pursuing this business faithfully year by year, it will bring a yearly revenue to each ward of thousands of dollars, making the people more and more able to perform works of benevolence and mercy and make themselves more and more comfortable in their living. The kingdom of God is upward and onward, 
and will so continue until its power and influence extend to the relief of the honest of all nations. It is for us to look to the welfare of the kingdom of God, for it alone will sustain us, build us up, and save us now and hereafter, and prepare us to enjoy a blessed eternity. May God bless you. Amen. Singing Anthem, Blessed is He Whose Transgression is Forgiven Prayer by Elder John Taylor Tuesday, 7th, 10 a.m. Singing, The Towers of Zion Soon Shall Rise Prayer by Elder Ezra T. Benson Singing Anthem, O Come, Let Us Sing Elder John Taylor glanced at what has been performed by the saints during the past 38 years since the Church was organized in spreading the gospel and extending a knowledge of truth among mankind. The principles which we have proclaimed and others which are yet to be taught are not new, as many in the world say, but they are as eternal as the heavens, and only appear to be new to degenerate man, who, if sunk in ignorance, and knows not the purposes of God, nor understands the principles of truth. The gospel has been revealed to raise those who will obey it from the low condition in which it finds them, to salvation and exaltation. We have been so enveloped in ignorance and evil that it is often difficult to discern between truth and error, between good and evil, between light and darkness. Many think they have the most perfect right to do, eat, drink, and wear whatever they please, no matter how injurious it may be. As moral agents, as members of society, as beings endowed with the power of procreating our kind, we have no right to do or partake of that which will injure our bodies, shorten our lives, or excite us to wrongdoing. We are accountable to God for abusing the tabernacles and powers which He has bestowed upon us. We are responsible to society, of which we are members, for our actions in society and our influence for good or evil, and we have no right to entail disease, suffering, and enfeebled organizations upon our posterity. He took up the subject of home manufacturers and cited examples of France and Britain, nations which trace their greatness to and base upon their manufactures. If we wish to be independent, we must be self-sustaining. President Young has led the way in cultivation and manufacture of cotton, and in the manufacture of wool and in other things, and his example is being followed. He is now leading out in silk. There is a duty devolving on the saints that they should cease to pattern after the world in foolishness, to live as servants of God and obey His laws, and to strive earnestly to follow the example set before them in the initiative steps to becoming self-sustaining. Elder Ezra T. Benson testified to the joy he experienced in obeying the principles of the gospel. He referred to the efforts made to gather the saints this coming season, and urged a continuation of them until the work proposed to be done is accomplished. He exhorted the saints to obedience and diligence and righteousness, and to hearken to the work of the Lord, that they might realize their desires and become indeed saints of God. In advocating abstinence from stimulants and heating food, he cited the case of Daniel and his associates in Babylon, who refused to use the rich viands of the king's palace and grew ruddy and fat on pulse and other simple articles of food. Other examples were cited to show the superiority of abstinence from strong drinks and of a simple diet such being conducive to sound health and life. The work we have to perform is binding on every Latter-day Saint. It is that we obey the requirements of heaven, purify ourselves, and carry out the counsels given unto us from the Lord through His servant, President Young. Singing, Anthem, Make a Joyful Noise unto the Lord All the Earth Prayer by Elder George Q. Cannon Tuesday, 2 p.m. At the hour for commencing meeting, the immense building was crowded, a large number being compelled to stand. Singing, Ye Ransomed of Our God. Prayer by Elder Orson Hyde. Singing, Great is the Lord and Marvelous. Elder Orson Hyde expressed his gratitude to God for the privilege of meeting with and having the opportunity of speaking to so vast a congregation. He spoke on the word of wisdom and dwelt upon abandoning the use of swine's flesh as soon as it can be done by the introduction of more healthy substitutes. Greater varieties of food must be obtained. Among these, rice might be named. Upland rice can be produced here cheaply and with good results. We should grow more fruit and greater varieties so that we can have fresh fruit all the year. He referred to the coming season's immigration and exhorted the people to have liberal feelings in preparing for sending to the railway terminus to bring the immigration here. 
Elder Hyde took up the subject of home manufactures and gave a practical illustration of his faith in it, by the suit of clothes in which he stood to preach, the yarn of which was spun, and the cloth made by his own family, and he took pleasure, he said, in wearing it for their sakes. He encouraged the culture of silk, and spoke in hopeful terms of the future. Though the prospects are fair for a more than liberal supply of grasshoppers, he believed that the Lord would preserve his people, though they may be scourged a little, to teach them to prize the counsels given them for their salvation, present and future. He urged upon the saints the adoption of the principles of dietetics laid before them during the present conference. Elder Orson Pratt said the Latter-day Saints had covenanted to serve the Lord, not for a time, but for all time, and that meant to do the will of the Lord when it is known, whether commanded or not. The word of wisdom had not been given as a command when it was revealed, because of the weakness of the human family, for that would have risked the penalty of disobedience sooner than obey it, had it been command. Thirty-five years on February last had elapsed since the word of wisdom was given, and it is time we had learned to do the will of God in this matter, as well as obey his commandments when made known to us. The speaker reasoned at length on the relations of the lower animal creation to the human family and the uses for which they have been made. He quoted various scriptures and revelations to show that they were made to be used by man with care and judgment, and not to be destroyed, when necessity does not require it. If we wantonly kill the wild animals around us that can be used for food, we might see the time when we would be glad that our sage plains were filled with them. The glorious time of peace that will be enjoyed in the millennium will see the brute creation robbed of their ferocity and the savage nature changed, and we should now view them as creatures of our Father and God and not destroy them in wantonness. Singing by the Choir Prayer by Elder Wilford Woodruff Wednesday, 8th, 10 a.m. Singing What wondrous things we now behold Prayer by Elder Erastus Snow Singing, glee, pull away cheerily Elder Erastus Snow reasoned on the foolishness of those who, having gathered to these valleys from the nations to serve God and help to build up his kingdom, allow themselves to be led away after the things that perish, striving to find gold and precious metals, associating with the wicked and ungodly, in seeking wealth, and casting away the pearl of salvation, that they may lay hold of things of little value, and which, if obtained, soon pass from the possession of those who have sacrificed so much to gain them. All things are for the saints, and though the wealth of this world had been claimed for so many ages by the adversary, the saints are the rightful heirs to it, and it will yet be given into, into the possession of those who remain faithful. How foolish, then, for them to seek to obtain wealth in ways forbidden by the Lord! The development of manufacturers and producing articles of usefulness and value are of infinitely more worth to us than the discovery of any gold and silver mines. He recommended all who have not declared their intentions of becoming citizens of the United States to do so, and prepare themselves for exercising the right to express themselves on the ballot box for their representatives and rules, when circumstances and legislation shall place the citizens of this territory in that position. This season's immigration was referred to, and continued liberality towards it was encouraged. Instead of dreading the locusts, we should learn wisdom from experience. The speaker advocated the exercise of the gospel feeling of charity towards the Lamanites, Though savage, bloodthirsty, and cruel, they have a work yet to perform in the future, and are preserved by the Lord for its accomplishment. But all who are exposed to Indian attacks and depredations should exercise the utmost vigilance, and yet with constant watchfulness they should possess generous feelings and be able to deal in justice with the savages. He spoke in an interesting manner of the condition of the settlements on the muddy, stating that those who had gone down south to St. Thomas last fall are prosperous and doing well. A number of those who went to St. Joseph were induced to go farther up the river to settle and returned disappointed, which threw them back for six weeks or two months, but now they are bidding fair to do well. He advised those who were called to go there last fall and have not yet done so, to honorably fill their mission and preserve their usefulness and the spirit of the work of God. The Gathering, Practical Duties, Emigration of the Poor, Mission to St. Joseph, Discourse by Elder Erastus Snow, Delivered in the New Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, April 8, 1868, Reported by David W. Evans. 
Thirty-eight years ago, the Prophet Joseph Smith, in a little upper room in Father Whitmer's house, Fayette, Seneca County, New York State, gathered six men together by commandment of God and proceeded to organize the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Perhaps this was the smallest number with which a church was ever organized, but the Savior compared the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed, which, he said, is the least of all seeds, by which, when grown, becomes greater than all herbs, so that the fowls of the air can lodge in its branches. From this small beginning the Latter-day Saints have become a great people. That which has brought this about, especially, has been the fulfilling of the commandments of God, given through Joseph and the ancient prophets, in reference to the gathering of his people from Babylon in the latter days. One reason assigned by the Lord for the gathering of his people is set forth in the revelations of St. John, where he says, Come out of her, O my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. This, in a few words, explains the chief reason for the Lord requiring his people to gather together. But the prophets Isaiah and Micah assign another good reason. They predict that the mountain of the Lord's house in the last days shall be established in the tops of the mountains, and the nations shall flow unto it, saying, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, for he will teach us of his ways that we may learn to walk in his paths. These two scriptures show unto us that the Lord has required his people to gather in the last days, that they might escape the sin of the wicked, and the plagues which shall be poured out upon them, and that they might be taught in his paths, taught to govern themselves, to correct their foolish habits and customs, and to train themselves and their offspring, that they might be able to build up Zion according to the law and order of heaven. We have already made a commendable advance in this direction. I rejoice in moving to and fro among this people, to see the spirit of improvement manifested by them in both temporal and spiritual things, and the increase of unity in their midst. Yet there is still room for further improvement in all these matters. There is one principle which fathers and mothers, and the elders of Israel generally, should understand and teach to their children. That is, what trials and tribulations this people have passed through to establish themselves in this, their mountain home, and that these things that have been born for the kingdom of heaven's sake, and not for filthy lucre's sake, had it been gold or silver or worldly comfort we had followed after, we should not have gathered together, but should have been scattered through the wicked world. We left these worldly considerations as we embraced the gospel and emigrated to this country, yet our common foe is on the alert to neutralize our efforts and to draw away our young men and many of the middle-aged who have forgotten the testimony of Jesus and have ceased to realize that this is the work of God, and when they hear reports of the discovery of gold or silver, they think they see a chance to make money by digging for gold or by freighting. They launch forth and strike hands with unbelievers, engage in their enterprises, and neglect the good word of God. This ought not to be. Our young men are heirs to the priesthood and of all the blessings of the new and everlasting covenant, and they ought not to employ themselves in building up the kingdom of darkness or spending their strength with unbelievers. But I suppose it is all right to have these temptations spread before us in order that the people may be proved, proven more effectually. It is important that our young men and all Israel who do not thoroughly understand these principles should be taught so that the love of the gospel may be uppermost in their hearts. I am persuaded that the Lord is perfectly willing that his people should possess every good thing the earth will afford, orchards, gardens, vineyards, houses, carriages, and every other good thing to be enjoyed with thanksgiving and used with prudence and judgment. I am aware that the hosts of hell have sought to control the wealth of the world, and Lucifer has ever sought to allure the righteous, as he did the Savior when he offered him the kingdoms and wealth of the world, if he would only fall down and worship him. It becomes the elders of Israel, young, middle-aged, or old, to imitate the example of the Savior in saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. As to the riches of the world, they belong to the Lord, and he gives them to whom he will. If we are determined to devote our lives to the kingdom of heaven and not to this world, we shall in due time inherit all that is good for us to inherit. And unless we realize the objects of our existence and learn to govern and control our spirits so as to devote ourselves and our energies and all the means given to us to build up Zion, then the good things of this life would be wasted upon us comparatively. During the progress of this conference, there have been various means of industry and enterprise spoken of and presented for the consideration of the people, such as the producing of wool, flax, hemp, cotton, and silk, 
and the introduction of machinery for the manufacture of the raw materials into the various fabrics necessary for the use of the people in cold and warm weather. The subject of developing the mineral resources of our territory is one of great importance. Iron, copper, coal, lead, zinc, and tin abound in our mountain home, and the development of these minerals is of far more importance to the welfare and prosperity of the nation than, than the development of mines containing the precious metals for the latter are limited in their use, while the grossest metals are those that, in their uses, enter into all the ramifications of life. The discovering and opening of gold and silver mines tempt the cupidity of the blind worshippers of mammon and spread corruption among the people. The prayers of every good man and woman should ascend to God, that in Zion these precious metals may be covered up and concealed, until it is his good pleasure for his saints to possess the kingdom so that they may be governed and controlled by the righteous instead of the wicked. There is much neglect in some of the distant settlements on the part of our foreign brethren with regard to taking out their naturalization papers. The word white is stricken from the constitution of Deseret, and when the citizens of African descent are admitted to the polls, the adopted sons of America who have come here to obtain homes for themselves and their posterity should not be indifferent respecting the rights of citizenship and neglect to take the steps necessary to secure to themselves the full privileges pertaining thereto. The emigration of the poor has commended itself to the hearts and feelings of the people. I am sure that their liberal response to their calls made upon them last October will do much to commend them to the favor of heaven and to secure the blessings of the Lord upon the labor of their hands. Let us continue in this great work and let every bishop and elder exert himself in his sphere to encourage the people to send in their available means of every kind that our president and those whom he calls to assist him may be able to carry out the glorious program he has adopted for the gathering of the poor. Let the people in every ward be awake and alive to this subject that neither provisions nor teams for the outfit may be lacking when the time comes to send for the poor. If the people find that their plans for freighting and other business are thwarted to some extent in doing this, they will, end, they will in the end find themselves richer for the Lord has given us abundant evidence in times past that he controls the avenues of wealth and prosperity to this people. And who need fear the locusts and grasshoppers? Have we not been tried in these things before? And if it is essential that we should be again all right, I can say with David of old, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. The Lord has said, It is my business to provide for my saints, and he does not do it, if we certainly cannot. We may plow, sow, and irrigate, but we cannot give the increase, and if the blade grows, it may wither, or the locusts devour it. And if they do, God directs them, for there is not a sparrow which is not fed by our Father in heaven, neither does a hair of our heads fall to the ground without being numbered, neither is there a locust that is not cared for by him who rolls all things, and he can dispose of them as seems to him good. He can move them east, west, north, or south, and can destroy or multiply them at pleasure, and he can preserve our crops but he certainly will not do it unless we adopt the measures he has ordained. We must plow and sow and plan and leave the, the event with him. He will not forsake his people, and he will provide the multitude that we may gather up. We may exert ourselves to the utmost to gather the poor and send forth our teams to bring them to our homes, and he will provide abundance for us to feed them and ourselves and the locusts that he sends among us. And when the locusts have eaten enough, he will bid them leave providing we are not over-anxious to transport our substance to feed the wicked and build up hell in our midst. If the Lord thinks that the locust will be less offensive and do less harm than herders of the ungodly on our borders, I am contented to feed them, provided our people will cease feeding our, their enemies. I do not mean that we shall cease feeding the hungry, no matter whether he is a saint or a sinner, but cease to feed and build up the wicked who will not labor with us to develop the resources of the country and help to build up Zion. God has called us to turn away from the folly of sustaining and building up Babylon, the worshippers of Mammon, those who have no interest in common with us in establishing Zion and building up the kingdom of our God upon the earth. With regard to the aborigines of this continent, there are several prophecies in the Book of Mormon to the effect that they will one day become a pure people, but that will not take place until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. Then, according to the promise, the Spirit of the Lord will be poured out upon them, and they will inherit the blessings promised. Until that time, we expect they will be a scourge upon the people of Zion, 
as the Lamanites were a scourge to the Nephites of old. That which the Lord is pleased to use as a scourge today, he may use in days to come, as a means of support and of strength. It becomes the Latter-day Saints as a people to cherish the principles of love and good will to all men, and especially the household of faith, and also to the natives, who are blind and ignorant pertaining to the principles of the gospel, and not to thirst for their blood, nor be very revengeful for every wrong that they, in their blindness, may commit, but to exercise generous forbearance. God will enable us to inflict such summary chastisement upon them, as circumstances may require, when it is his good pleasure that they should be chastened, or else he will take it in hand himself, for he can easily destroy by various diseases those who are shedding the blood of the saints, and this will be far more acceptable to him than if it were done by us. It certainly ought not to be spe specially gratifying to any one to shed the blood of his fellows, whether red, black, or white. I have seen the Lord has taken care of the Lamanites as well as the Latter-day Saints, and he requires that we should exercise our reasoning powers and not throw ourselves heedlessly in p into positions where we are exposed to the wrath of the savages. Inexperienced men who are unacquainted with Indian habits and customs and their mode of warfare should never be trusted beyond the confines of our settlements with their wives and families to commence operation on their own account. They thereby tempt the cupidity of the savages, men of experience, energy, watchfulness, men with kind hearts and generous impulses, who can forgive an injury, are the men who should be selected on all occasions to lead out in the formation of new settlements on our frontiers, and they should be sustained by obedient and experienced men who will help to control and take care of the people and keep them out of danger. I have thought many a time that the Lord has suffered the natives in various places to drive in our outpost, just as, in, just as a wise vine dresser will clip off the end of his vines that they may produce more fruit and make less wood. We are sometimes in the habit of scattering too far. Being over-anxious to spread, we lay on more warp than we have filling for. I would say a word in relation to the missionaries who went south last fall to the Muddy. Brother Joseph W. Young and myself left here on the 2nd of March and visited the settlements between this place and St. Thomas on the Muddy. The bad condition of the roads and the limited amount of time at our command, having to return here to conference, prevented us devoting that amount of time to the settlements that we wished to but we found them generally in a prosperous condition, though in some places we were reminded of what we saw last winter in Salt Lake City, and of Israel of old when Moses went up into the mountain and they got Aaron to make them a calf. Still, as a general thing, we found the people prosperous. I will say for the benefit of those who have sons and daughters and friends there, who have been reared in and about Salt Lake City and the older settlements, that it must not be expected that everything will run smooth with them, or that they will realize all their expectations. There are many here who assisted in establishing settlements in Salt Lake Valley and who know the difficulties we had to encounter in the first two or three years. And there are others who have gone out and buffeted the difficulties of establishing settlements upon our borders north and south. The country on the Muddy affords facilities for extensive and prosperous settlements, but there is a lack of timber. They have done very well for fuel as within 30 miles of St. Thomas, there are large groves of cedar and pinion pine, which will supply them with fuel for many years, and a good natural road to it, and springs of water in the grove. There is also considerable sawing timber in the mountains 20 miles east of St. Thomas, and a much larger body of excellent saw timber in the mountains west of St. Thomas, about 50 or 60 miles. But in both these places, portable steam mills are necessary, as there are springs of water in the timber, but no creeks sufficient for water mills, and until they are able to get mills to saw their lumber, they cannot make very much advance toward building. As to fencing, the only fences in the region of the country are two stone corrals, one in each settlement for corralling the stock at night which is herded in the day, and I am fully satisfied that it is very much cheaper, and that they will make far greater progress in developing the country by adopting the system of herding their stock than they would by attempting to fence their land. And I will say that in my visit to the country I have not, to the best of my recollection, seen one single animal preying on the crops in that section of country. I wish I could say as much for the best fenced sections of the country in other portions of the territory. Those who went down to St. Thomas last fall seem comfortable, pleasant, and happy. Everything around them exhibits an air of thrift and comfort. I cannot say quite as much for those located at St. Joseph. For many of those who went to that settlement heard of a country higher upstream and they felt anxious to visit it, 
and instead of settling down at once and beginning to improve and make themselves a home, they waited in hope of a better co of finding a better country. By and by, in the course of the winter, a man, who was responsible and ought to have taken a different course, led them up to the upper muddy, and when they were called back again to St. Joseph, they came feeling disappointed. The result was, their feelings were unsettled, and six weeks or two months of their labor may be said to have been thrown away, and yet not thrown away, for I trust the experience they have received and the instruction which followed have sealed lessons on their minds that they will not forget and that will prove more valuable to them than any amount of means they would have earned by that two months' labor, and I trust God will overrule it for their good. They were much pleased and rejoiced to see us among them, and to hear our word, and were ready and willing to be told what to do, and to go with their might and do it, and I believe that since our first, that since our visit among them they have settled down in their feelings and have gone to work in good earnest to make themselves homes. They have not Salt Lake Market to go to, and they cannot procure all the little luxuries of life, and their food and manner of living will necessarily be somewhat crude and primitive, but wholesome and healthy. I scarcely know of a single instance of sickness among them. There were a few who, when they were migrating south last year during the months of November and December, and were exposed to severe storms, took cold and fever, but since their arrival in that country they have been healthy. It is very nat natural for them, like children, to feel after home and father and mother and the scenes of their youth, and it is very natural, too, for the sympathies of parents to be with their children. But let not this mistaken sympathy lead parents to give wrong counsel to their children to their hurt. It requires stout hearts to develop a new country like that, but perseverance, time, and patience will accomplish it. There is plenty of bread, the staff of life in the country, and no necessity for actual want among any of them. It is not now as it has been in St. George and on the Muddy, where there was no bread in the country, and we had to come to San Pete or to Salt Lake City to fetch it. I would say to all who have been called and have not gone, for judging from the best information I have, not above half those called are in the southern country. For the sake of your own future welfare and prosperity, respond to the calls that have been made upon you, and strive to fill that mission with confidence, boldness, and energy. Or, if there are good and sufficient reasons why you should not do so, go to the President and make known your circumstances, that you may be released, that your consciences may not condemn you, and that your God may not condemn you, and that your future usefulness may not be curtailed. Let no one flatter himself that he can pass along in obscurity unnoticed, and neither magnify his calling, nor yet be discharged from it. It will linger around you, it will haunt you, and will be like a canker worm gnawing at the root of your felicity. Take steps to be exonerated one way or the other, and God will bless you. Amen. President H. C. Kimball said if anybody wished to see a miracle, they had only to look upon the congregation before him, and look back over the growth of the church from the time when the entire members of it could be seated in a small room, and we were increasing rapidly. He urged the exercise of increasing watch care over our growing sons and daughters. They should all attend meetings regularly, learn the principles of truth, and grow up to be more useful. He was in favor of ordaining the boys to the priesthood and watching and training them with great care, that they might learn of the power and importance of the blessings thus bestowed upon them. The spirit and sealing power of Elias are with President Young to seal together the fathers and the children, that they may be one, and that the whole people may be united in working out salvation. We should all take a course to save our offspring, and the man who cannot save his children his family cannot save himself. Singing Seraph's Anthem, Our King is Risen Indeed, Hallelujah. Prayer by Elder Ezra T. Benson. 2 p.m. Singing Come, O Thou King of Kings. Prayer by Elder Lorenzo Snow. Singing Anthem, I Will Sing of the Mercies of the Lord. President B. Young presented the First Presidency and Twelve Apostles to the Conference, and Elder George Q. Cannon presented the rest of the authorities of the church in the following order. All were sustained and every vote was unanimous. Brigham Young, President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Heber C. Kimball, his first, and Daniel H. Wells, his second counselor. Orson Hyde, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and Orson Pratt, Sr., John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, George A. Smith, Ezra T. Benson, Charles C. Rich, Lorenzo Snow, Erastus Snow, Franklin D. Richards, George Q. Cannon and Joseph F. Smith, 
members of said quorum. John Smith, Patriarch of the Church. Daniel Spencer, President of this Stake of Zion, and George B. Wallace and Joseph W. Young, his counselors. William Eddington, John T. Kane, John L. Blythe, Howard O. Spencer, Claudius V. Spencer, John Squires, William H. Folsom, Emmanuel M. Murphy, Thomas E. Jeremy, George W. Thatcher, Peter Nebaker, and Charles S. Kimball, members of the High Council. John Young, President of the High Priest Quorum, Edwin D. Woolley and Samuel W. Richards, his counselors. Joseph Young, President of the First Seven Presidents of the Seventies, and Levi W. Hancock, Henry Harriman, Albert P. Rockwood, Horace S. Eldridge, Jacob Gates, and John Van Cott, members of the First Seven Presidency Presidents of the Seventies. Edward Hunter, Presiding Bishop, Leonard W. Hardy, and Jesse C. Little, his counselors. Samuel W. Ladd, President of the Priest Quorum, William Carmichael, and Robert Price, his counselors. Adam Spears, President of the Teachers Quorum, Henry I. Doramus, and Martin Lency, his counselors. James Leach, President of the Deacons Quorum, Warren Hardy, and Charles S. Cram, his counselors. Brigham Young, Trustee and Trust for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Daniel H. Wells, Superintendent of Public Works. Truman O. Angel, Architect for the Church. Brigham Young, President of the Perpetual Emigration Fund to Gather the Poor. Heber C. Kimball, Daniel H. Wells, and Edward Hunter, his assistants for said fund. George A. Smith, historian and general church recorder, and Wilford Woodruff, his assistant. The names of the following brethren who are called to go on missions to preach the gospel were then read to the conference, and a vote taken if the people would sustain them by their faith and their prayers, which was unanimous. Lewis Grant, Session Settlement, M. F. Farnsworth, Salt Lake City, William C. Thomas, Brigham City, William Jackson Bell, Provo City, George Teasdale, Salt Lake City, Hayden W. Church, St. George, Owen Dix, St. George, John Hawley, Pine Valley, Newton Adair, Washington, James E. Fisher, Provo Valley, John Albiston, Cache Valley, Hans Peterson, Hiram, Cache County, Lucius Peck, Salt Lake City, O. H. Riggs, Salt Lake City, Lyman Schaefer, Provo City, John Hindley, Salt Lake City and American Fork, Peter Nebaker, Salt Lake City, Theodore B. Lewis, Cottonwood, Salt Lake County, Edmund Eldridge, Colville, Josiah M. Farron, Ogden Valley, Hiram B. Clemens, Colville, William Howard Sr., Big Cottonwood. President Young then gave to all the young brethren over twenty years of age missions to marry and make homes for themselves and the young sisters to learn household and domestic duties. He recommended the sisters to organize societies for silk culture and other useful purposes and to get straw and make their own hats and bonnets. He instructed mothers how to take care of their children that they may be clean and nice and beautiful and pleasant to look upon. And he advised the bishops to keep these councils before the people. He instructed the congregation on various practical matters, showing the young people whom he advised to marry how they can make themselves comfortable in pleasant and happy homes. Fish culture, poultry raising, wool growing, flax culture, and other branches of industry were dealt upon in an interesting and most instructive manner. During the course of his remarks, he strongly urged the brethren not to go hunting gold or gold mining, but to stay at home and attend to the duties which are here for them to perform and they will prosper. Domestic economy, training children, cultivation of silk, application of labor, longevity. Remarks by President Brigham Young, delivered in the New Tabernacle, afternoon, April 8, 1868. Reported by G.D. Watt. President Heber C. Kimball has exhorted the bishops to gather around them the young men and teach them the privileges which they enjoy, and try to lead them in the right way. Bishops, I wish you to hearken to this piece of good advice. I will give each of the young men in Israel who have arrived at an age to marry a mission to go straightway and get married to a good sister, fence a city lot, lay out a garden and orchard, and make a home, and especially do not forget to plant a proper proportion of mulberry trees. This is the mission that I give to all the young men in Israel. And I say to you, sisters, if you do not know how to milk a cow, you can soon learn. If you do not know how to feed the cows, you can learn. 
If you do not know how to feed the chickens, get them and learn how. And if your husband takes you to live in ever so small and humble a cottage, make it neat and nice and clean and set out flowers around the doors. And let the husband plant fruit trees and shade trees and let wives help their husbands, that they may be encouraged to take hold of more important business that will create an income sufficient to sustain their wives and by economy and care become wealthy in a short time and have your carriage to ride in. What a satisfaction it will be to you to know that what you possess is the result of your industry and economy. It was not given to us by the grandfather, or by father, or by mother, or any relation, but we have got these comforts by our own industry, saving, and the blessings of the Lord. By the means our young men and maidens will gain for themselves credit, respect, and a name in Israel worthy of the admiration of all good persons. How much better is this course than the opposite, to spend precious time to no profit, always being in a state of dependence? Were the Lord to speak of such conduct, he would use terms to show that he is not well pleased with it. I have a short sermon for my sisters. I wish you, under the direction of your bishops and wise men, to establish your relief societies and organize yourself under the direction of the brethren, and establish yourselves for doing business, gathering up your little amount of means that would otherwise go to waste, and put them to usury, and make more of them, and keep, and thus keep gathering in. Let this be commenced forthwith. Ask your husbands to furnish you some straw for hats and bonnets, and when you get it, put more than three straws over your head, and make a hat that will shade you from the scorching sun. I have a great desire to live and see the prosperity of this people, and one thing among the rest, I would like to see the time when our sisters will take more pains to beautify their children. When your children arise in the morning, instead of sending them out of doors to wash in the cold, hard water with a little soft soap, and of wiping them as though you would tear the skin off them, creating roughness and darkness of skin, take a piece of soft flannel and wipe the faces of your children smooth and nice, dry them with a soft cloth, and instead of giving them pork for their breakfast, give them good wholesome bread and sweet milk, baked potatoes, and also buttermilk if they like it, and a little fruit and I would have no objections to their eating a little rice. Rice is an excellent food for children, and I wish some of the brethren would cultivate it in these valleys. Upland rice will flourish in this country. Train up your children to be beautiful and fair, instead of neglecting them until they are sunburned and become like the natives of our mountains. Let the sisters take care of themselves and make themselves beautiful. And if any of you are so superstitious and ignorant as to say that this is pride, I can say that you are not informed as to the pride which is sinful before the Lord. You are also ignorant as to the excellency of the heavens, and of the beauty which dwells in the society of the gods. Were you to see an angel, you would see a beautiful and lovely creature. Make yourselves like angels in goodness and beauty. Let the mothers in Israel make their sons and daughters healthy and beautiful by cleanliness and a proper diet. Whether you have much or little clothing for your children, it can be kept clean and healthy and be made to fit their persons neatly. Make your children lovely and fair, that you may delight in them. Cease to send out your children to herd sheep with their skins exposed to the hot sun, until their hands and faces appear as though they've lived in an ash heap. I call upon my sisters to lead out in these things, and create your own fashions, and make your clothing to please yourselves, independent of outside influences, and make your hats and bonnets to shade you. I wish you, sisters, to listen to these counsels and place yourself in a condition to administer to the poor. Get your husbands to provide you with a little this and a little of that of which you can make something by adding your own labor. I do not mean that you shall apply to them for five dollars and ten dollars to spend for that which is of no profit, but manufacture something that will be useful as well as beautiful and comely. You want to enter into the cultivation of silk. Our bench lands are well adapted to the growth of the mulberry tree the leaves of which can produce the natural food for the silkworm. There is no better land nor climate in the world than we have for this branch of business. We can make ourselves independently rich at this business alone if it is properly pursued. There ought to be a plot of land in each ward developed, devoted to the cultivation of silk and a cocoonery built in the center of it. And in the season thereof, let the children of the wards who have nothing to do and aged people gathering, gather the leaves and feed the worms. The work is light and interesting, while the sales of wound silk, for which there is always a market to be found, will do much toward feeding and clothing poor persons that would otherwise be entirely dependent. 
If the worms are well taken care of, the season of feeding only lasts from 35 to 40 days. If I cannot succeed in getting the sisters with their children to attend to this business, I shall be under the necessity of sending to China for Chinamen to come here and raise silk for us, which I do not wish to do. To pay people the wages they want here would prevent us from raising silk profitably. We look forward to the period when the price of labor here will be brought to a reasonable and judicious standard. Now, sisters, go to forthwith and get you an acre of land, and get the bishops and the brethren to fence it, and prepare it for the reception of the trees, and go and help them. But be sure to wear a wide-brimmed hat while doing it, so as not to get tanned with the sun and the wind. Go to and raise silk. You can do it, and those who cannot set themselves to work, we will set them to work gathering straw, and making straw hats and, bo and straw bonnets. We will set others gathering willows, and others to making baskets. We will set others to gathering flags and rushes, and to making mats, and bottoming chairs, and making carpets. I pray you in Christ's stead to let gold hunting alone, and pray the Lord to cover it up in our region of country that it cannot be found. Those among us who are anxious to find rich gold deposits are equally anxious to destroy themselves, and are no wiser than our little children are in handling sharp-edged tools. They would not only destroy themselves, but all around them if they had the power to do it. Instead of hunting gold, let every man go to work at raising wheat, oats, barley, corn, and vegetables, and fruit in abundance, that there may be plenty in the land. Raise sheep, and produce the finest quality of wool in large quantities. By the migratory system of feeding sheep in this country they will be healthy, and produce large clips of wool. I hope, by the blessings of the Lord, to demonstrate this the present season. In these pursuits are the true sources of wealth, and we have as much capital in these mountains to begin with as any people in the world, according to the number of our community. Real capital consists in knowledge and physical strength. If we know how to apply our labor, it will produce for us everything we can ask for. It will bring to us the food and the clothing we want, and every facility we need for comfort, for refinement, for excellence, for beauty, and for adornment. It will bring to us the wealth of the world, the gold and the silver, although gold and silver are not real wealth. They are useful as a medium of exchange, as foundation upon which to base a currency, and to use as ornaments and, hold vessel and household vessels. And so gold should be regarded until there is enough of it to pave our streets. O ye elders of Israel who are greedy for gold, instead of wasting your time in search of it, gather around you the comforts of life with which the elements are loaded, and make yourselves rich in all the elegancies and conveniences by means of economy and industry. I wish the sisters to lead out in fashions. It is very little difference what fashion you produce. I would just as soon as see you wear hats with wide brims as not, if you have that fashion that will give comfort and convenience and produce health and longevity. We wish to promote the longevity of the people. Tell your husbands you can get a heifer calf or two and some chickens and you will feed them and take care of them, instead of feeding pigs. And if your husbands have springs on their land, get them to clean them out and dam them up a little and introduce the spawn of the best fish we have in the mountains and collect all the information that has been printed and which comes within your reach on the subject of raising fish. And raise your potatoes and parsnips and carrots for feeding them with, adding a little cornmeal or a little oatmeal. We can raise fish here and the cost will be one-fourth less per pound than other meats. You may think that fowls are injurious to the garden, but they are not. They will pick up grubs and cut worms and other destructive insects, and the good they do in this respect will far overbalance any trifling injury they may do to young plants. They will keep your garden clean of these pests and fatten, give you plenty of eggs to eat. Take care of them and get a little patch of lucerne planted to give to, give to your young heifer and rear her until she gives you her increase. This is for you young women who want to get husbands. Tell the young men that you will sustain yourselves and teach them how to sustain themselves if they do not know how, if they will only come and marry you. Now, girls, court up the boys. It is a leap year. Give them to understand in some way that it is all right. You are ready, and you want to help them to make a good home, to form a nucleus around which, to gather the blessings and comforts of life, a place to rally to. While you are on the move and unsettled, you can get nothing that is permanent. Tell the boys what to do, and you sisters of experience, ye mothers in Israel, go to and get up your societies, 
and teach these girls what to do, and how to get the boys to come and marry them. The neglect and lazy habits which our boys are falling into are a disgrace to us, to say nothing about the sin of such conduct. They produce nothing, and consider themselves unable to take care of a family, and they will not marry. This conduct of theirs leaves our young women without partners. They want somebody to look to, and something they can do to advantage and bless themselves, and have a home to go to. Young men, fit you up a little log cabin, if it is not more than ten feet square, and then get you a bird to put in your little cage. You can then work all day with satisfaction to yourself, considering that you have a home to go to, and a loving heart to welcome you. You will then have something to encourage you to labor and gather around you the comforts of life, and a place to gather them to. Strive to make your little home attractive. Use lime freely, and let your houses nestle between the cool shades of trees, and be made fragrant with perfumes of flowers. These are practical teachings. They are things which the people must be taught. For if we do not learn to take care of ourselves and save ourselves, who will do it for us? Will the Gentiles help us and care for us? Will they do us good? No. And I tell you further, elders of Israel, that you do not know the day of your visitation. Neither do you understand the signs of the times. For if you did, you would be awake to these things. Every organization of our government, the best government in the world, is crumbling to pieces. Those who have it in their hands are the ones who are destroying it. How long will it be before the words of the Prophet Joseph will be fulfilled? He said, If the Constitution of the United States were saved at all, it must be done by this people. It will not be many years before these words come to pass. How long will it be before they will be coming here for bread, for the bread of life, and for the bread which sustains the body? Do you know this? You do not. This community live, as it were, from hand to mouth. They must learn to lay up food. Notwithstanding all that has been said to the people on this subject, not one man to thirty has bread sufficient to last him one year. As our mechanics are paid, they might have laid up their hundreds, if not their thousands a year. Brethren, learn. You have learned a good deal, it is true, but learn more. Learn to sustain yourselves. Lay up grain and flour and save it against a day of scarcity. Sisters, do not ask your husbands to sell the last bushel of grain you have to buy something for you out of the stores, but aid your husbands in storing it up against a day of want, and always have a year or two's provision on hand. A great abundance of fruit can be dried. There are but few families in this city who do not have the privilege of drying and laying up fruit, yet the majority of family in this community, instead of using fruit that was dried last fall but one, are using fruit dried last year when the grasshoppers were here. A year's supply should be kept ahead, so that the families could not be compelled to eat fruit that had been injured by grasshoppers and other insects. We should accumulate all kinds of nutritive substances and preserve them from worms, which can easily be done. If we do not take care of ourselves, we shall have a very poor chance to be taken care of. If we will hearken to the counsel that has been given to us, we shall know how to sustain ourselves in every particular. Mothers in Israel, sisters, ask your husbands to take care of the sheep they have got, and not willfully waste them, but multiply them, and bring our wool in the factories to be manufactured, or trade it for yarn and cloth. The woolen mills which we now have in the country will work up a great deal of wool if they can get it. Who is there in our community that raises flax? If there, is there any attention paid to this culture? I think not. But it is, husband, sell your wheat, sell your oats, and buy me the linen I want. We shall in the future have flax machines here to make the finest of linen, and we can make the cotton and silk in abundance. I would urge the brethren of the southern country to plant cotton sufficient to supply the wants of the factories that are now in the country, and let us continue our labors until we can manufacture everything we want. All this is embraced in our religion, every good word and work, all things temporal and all things spiritual, Things in heaven, things on earth, and things that are under the earth are circumscribed by our religion. We are in the fastnesses of the mountains, and if we do these things and delight in doing right, our feet will be made fast and immovable, like the bases of these everlasting hills. We ought not to desire anything, only on righteous principles. And if we want right, then let us then deal it out to others, being kind and full of love and charity to all. My brethren and sisters, I have occupied considerable time, but I have not spoken one-tenth of what I wish to say to you. By the authority that the Lord has granted me, I bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Elder Lorenzo Snow touched upon the practical character of the counsels given and requirements made of us. Between them and those given to ancient Israel, the results desired in either case being to communicate knowledge by which those who lack it can learn to take care of themselves and organize from the elements around that which will sustain life and contribute to make it comfortable, enjoyable, and happy. He treated upon the elevating nature of the gospel and dwelt at some length on the evil results of going gold hunting, singing, Lo, the Gentile chain is broken with chorus. The conference was adjourned till the 6th of October next at 10 o'clock in the morning to meet in the new tabernacle. Benediction by Elder George A. Smith, Edward L. Sloan, Clerk of Conference.